Good morning. Good morning. Oh, jeez. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. There you go. What a wonderful day. This is the day that the Lord has made. Uh, before we start our liturgy today, I want to say a couple thank yous, uh, starting with uh, Pastor Mike and his team uh, at the Christ Community Church for providing the music and making these beautiful bulletins, and the folks at Rotary who agree to leave the infrastructure up, and uh, for Ted Canning for uh, operating our uh, uh, audio system here, and uh, numerous other people, uh, including my colleagues at the churches in the village. So welcome on behalf of all the churches in the village. And let's just take a moment to uh, set aside the cares of the world uh, for a brief few moments this morning and offer a praise to God. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging symbol. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Please join me in prayer. You have walked many miles with us, O oh God. You have comforted and strengthened us along the way. Keep us on your path, for we easily lose our way. As we learn to live in your ways, help us choose the cause of justice and righteousness. Amen. Please stand for the opening song.
Friends, may the peace of the Lord be always with you, and also with you. Let us share the sign of the peace with each other. It's in the monitor.
I know where he can score some. If there are any young people here in the uh, in the congregation this morning, it's time for the children's message. So come on up, and uh, it's nice and dry here, so hopefully you can just sit right on the grass in front of me. Come on up. Look forward to seeing you. There they come. There you go, Samantha. Well, good morning, guys. My name is Bill Lewis, and I go to the, the Methodist Church, which is way down at the bottom of the hill. There's a, a roundabout down there, and our church is right there next to the roundabout. And so I've been thinking about what I could talk to you guys about this week. And there was a fellow that you probably don't know. Maybe some of your parents don't even remember this guy because it's been so long since uh, he's been on TV. He's on t a television personality. His name was David Letterman. Anyone ever heard of David Letterman? Didn't think so. How about out there? David Letterman. Okay, he's, he's still around, but uh, he was on really, really late at night. In fact, his, his TV show was called Late Night with David Letterman. And he was an entertainer. He did funny things. And, and one of the things I remember most, he, he did a little sketch called Will It Float? Remember, Will It Float? And he got this great big container with water. And then he got some item, all kind of weird stuff. And then he would ask the audience if they thought this thing would sink or if it would float. And then he would drop it in to see if it would sink or float. So I thought it might be fun to do something like that. So, I brought a, a jar here, and we're going to carefully pour this into the jar. Okay. Now, the item that I brought to see if you think it will float or sink is, anyone know what this is? An orange, very good. Okay. Now, here's my question. Will it float? Okay. You don't think so, okay? Let, let's let's say how, how the congregation feels about this. How many of you guys think that the orange will float? Oh, I see some hands up there. How many think the orange will sink? It's about 50-50, I think. All right, let's find out who was right. Here's the orange. Drop it in. And it floats. Anyone who thought the orange would float? Congratulations. Now, as I was practicing this little gimmick this week, it, it made me think of someone in the Bible who not only could float, but he could walk on water. Do you, anyone know who I'm talking about? Jesus. Jesus. He was actually able to walk on top of water. And, and the story I want to share, this happened a long, long time ago. Uh, at a place called the Sea of Galilee. Now, it really was more like a lake than a sea, but, but there were some friends of his, some, uh, some followers, in a little boat. And it was actually at night, so that made it even more scary. And they were out in this boat, and all of a sudden a storm comes up. Kind of like Wednesday. If you remember what happened on Wednesday around here? And this storm, it got really, really windy, and the waves got really big. And, and the guys in the boat, they were afraid the boat was going to upset, and they were going to drown. And so... To make matters worse, they looked across this darkened sea with all the waves, and they thought they saw this form walking toward them. They thought it might be a ghost. And finally, they realized it was Jesus. And so one of the fellows in the boat, his name was Peter, said, If you're Jesus, you know, tell me, I'll let me come to you. And Jesus said, Come. And he motioned to her to come. And sure enough, Peter also was able to get out of the boat and walk across the water toward Jesus. But then, as he was starting to do this, the wind really started to blow, and the waves were terrible, and he began, Peter began to get scared. He began to doubt. And guess what happened? He starts sinking down into the water. He was very afraid. And it kind of was a vicious cycle, because the more he got scared, and the more he doubted, the, the further down he sank. And the more he sank, the more he got scared. And finally, he yelled out to Jesus, Jesus, save me! And Jesus looked over to him and said, you know, 
why do you doubt? And by this time, he was actually close enough to touch him. And when he said that, he was actually able to restore Peter's confidence. And he walked back and got back into the boat again with his friends. So that's the story of what Jesus can Not only was Jesus able to walk on water, he was able to help people walk on water. Now, I want you to look at this orange that's floating here, because there's one more thing I want you to remember. Okay? Take it out. You see this hard yellow stuff around, orange stuff around the outside? What is that? The peel or the skin, okay? And why is it there? Why, is it, why does it have the skin here? Right, protect it from animals or insects. And this, this goes all the way around. It protects it. And I got to thinking, you know, God sends protection for us, too. He sends us his love and his grace. But sometimes we don't accept that love, that protection. And we say, no, we can go it alone. And when we say that, it's kind of like we're taking a little bit of the protection that God wants us to have, and we cut it off of ourselves. But, you know, God wasn't the only person who can you know, send us protection. You guys have parents, right? Your mother and your dad. And sometimes your mother and your dad, they love you very much, just like God does. They don't want you to get hurt. And so they tell you not to do something. But you do it anyway. And that's like taking off war, this protection. And maybe you have grandparents, and they tell you to do something, and you don't because you, you want to do it on your own. Or an older brother, like I have, who wants to uh, help protect you. And you know what? It's not just kids that do this. Adults do it, too. When God asks us to do something that we think, nah, I don't need God's protection. I can, I can do it on my own. And so we do. We, we go it on our own. And guess what happens? Before too long, all of our protection is gone. And it's like this orange here has totally lost all of its coat. All protection gone. Now, Karen, I want you to do me a favor. This orange, the loss of protection, I want you to drop it in the water and see if it floats. It doesn't float anymore, does it? And that's what happened to us if we don't accept God's protection. You know, when we need it most, when, when you know, scary things happen in our lives and we, we try to walk by ourselves without God's protection, then we don't float anymore. We sink to the bottom. And so I want you to remember this. And uh, hopefully, you know, when God or your parents or your big brother uh, gives you some suggestions to keep you safe, well, you'll, you'll take them. So let's take a quick prayer, okay? Dear God, Thank you for loving us and, and giving us your protection. Help us to always accept that protection and, and never reject it because we know that if we do, when bad times come, we're going to sink. Amen. Thank you guys for coming up here today. Appreciate it. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I actually have some oranges. So if anybody wants to take this home and try it yourself, or show somebody who isn't here today, uh, let me give you an orange. And you know what the best part about this whole thing is? When you get done with this, you can eat the scent of the part that's inside. It's very, very good and very good for you. So, you like an orange? So, can you catch it? Awesome. All right. Yeah. <laughs> There's one for you. Nice orange for you. Nice orange for you. But you can catch it, can't you? Go deep. <laughs> there you go. Thank you, Bill. You're always a blessing, and we always learn something, so that's fun. Good morning. Good morning. It's nice to see you all here this morning. 
Uh, it's time to hear scripture. If you brought your Bible or you have a Bible app, I invite you to open that as we listen to the Word of God this morning. Coming from the Psalms, Psalm 138, when the truck goes by. <laughs> listen to the Word of God. This is a Psalm of David. I will praise you, Lord, with all my heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. I will bow down toward your holy temple and will praise your name for your unfailing love and for your faithfulness. For you have so exalted your solemn decree that it surpasses your fame. When I called, you answered me. You greatly emboldened me. May all the kings of the earth praise you, Lord when they hear what you have decreed. May they sing of the ways of the Lord, for the glory of the Lord is great. Though the Lord is exalted, he looks kindly on the lowly. Though lofty, he sees them from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the anger of my foes. With your right hand, you save me. The Lord will vindicate me. Your love, Lord, endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. The word of God for the people of God. <coughs> We invite you to stand and join us as we continue singing together.
Thank you. Please be seated. Well, I am uh, equally as grateful to be here with you all, along with um, everybody that's participating. I'm uh, Mike, pastor at a church up on Center Street. And um, at church, our church, we have the, I have this ongoing threat. The threat is that sometime I'm going to show up wearing shorts for church. And I said to my wife this morning, I said, today's the day. I'm going to do it. I'm going to wear shorts. And she said, oh, honey, seriously, if I had legs like yours, I would never wear shorts in public. That was my wife. Well, this morning, I want to invite you not to wear shorts if you have legs like mine, but I want to invite you along to a rather obscure, little, Old Testament book. It's Nehemiah. Um, if you can open your Bible or a, a Bible app to that, that would be awesome. Um, if you don't know where it is, if you got a paper Bible, that's all right. Not many of us do. We have to use the index in the front. But it's if you can find Psalms where we were earlier, just go left three books and you'll be in Nehemiah. It's pretty simple once you find out where Psalms are. So why are we looking at Nehemiah? Um, well, we're going to be looking specifically at chapter 8 in Nehemiah, and even more specifically, just the first 10 verses in Nehemiah chapter 8. But of all places, why Nehemiah this morning? I think there are three reasons, actually, I want to share with you. The first one is this. Um, again, back where I go to church with some of you, we have been working our way through Nehemiah over these last several weeks, and it worked out actually quite amazingly that where we were this morning in Nehemiah chapter 8 is so appropriate for where we are together this morning. And you'll learn why, I think, in a sec. Um, because secondly, though, it's because this book, Nehemiah, is obscure as it might be to some of us, we see in Nehemiah a people who desire to follow God struggling to do so. Do you struggle to follow God in a really deeply committed way? You'd fit right in with this group. It's, they're, they're struggling to live honorably, and here's, here's why they're struggling in, to be committed and live honorably. Because they live in a culture that has a completely different set of values. They live in a culture that does not fear or honor God. Much is the same as our culture today. And the third reason, interestingly enough, that we're in Nehemiah 8 this morning is we actually encounter a setting that is very similar to this, an open air gathering. Read with me. Uh, I'll read it, but you follow along in Nehemiah chapter 8. I'm just going to read the first 10 verses. <clears throat> and by the way, when we get to verse 6, 7, 8, 9, there's a lot of really complicated names in there that I am not going to mention. <laughs> because my mom taught me that it's better to keep your mouth shut and be thought a fool than to open it and remove all doubt. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. For some of you older folks, this is a different water gate. And they told Ezra, the scribe, to bring out the Bible, the book of the law, the book of Moses specifically, that was the book of the law that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly both and so here's the assembly it's men and women and all who could understand what they heard so Bill there would have been children there and they would have gathered as well and on the first day of the seventh month that's an important notice it was the first day of the seventh month and Ezra read it from it read from it facing the square before the water gate and early, from early morning until midday, in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform 
that they had made just for this purpose. And beside him stood some of those people. They were on his left-hand side and some were on his right-hand side. And verse 5 says, Ezra opened the book of the law in the sight of all the people, for he was raised up and they could all see him. And listen to what it says. As he opened it, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen! Amen! Lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And then there were a bunch of other men who stood there who helped the rest of the people understand what he was reading. So Ezra would speak from the Bible, and then dispersed in this crowd were these other men who would actually then turn and make sure everybody understood what he was reading. Verse 8. They read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave sense so that the people understood. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, this day is awesome basically my translation this day is holy to the Lord your God don't mourn or weep because all the people when they had heard the words of the law were actually weeping and so he said to them no 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 don't don't do that go go to your homes and eat and drink and send if, if there's other people who didn't bring anything make sure they have some for this day is holy to the Lord our God don't be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord. Let's get a glimpse of the setting. So there's this huge crowd of people. Way more people than what we have gathered. There would have been likely in the thousands. Could you imagine as far as this whole green area is probably just packed with people. Gathered in this public square, much like ours. Except they didn't have the chairs or the benches, or the sunglasses, or canopies, or PA systems. It was an amazing sight to behold. This huge rally. But it was all for the Word of God. They stood, it says, on their feet from daybreak to midday. That's amazing. That's like five hours just listening to the Word of God. Moms dads, children, even, even teenagers. <laughs> yeah, even them. <laughs> Nobody's preaching. They're just reading the Bible. Five hours. It reminds me, actually, when I think about how long sometimes I get carried away preaching. Uh, just ask anybody in our congregation. But last, just last week, I saw a guy. He actually got up near the beginning and left and you know from up here you can see all kinds of things so be careful what you do if you're not paying attention I see it if you're starting to, to nap off I, I see that well I saw this person get up it was Jerry actually I had just full confession it was Jerry he got up and walked out and then right near the end he came back in and so after the service I'm looking for him and I find him and I'm like Jerry what was that all about where'd you go he said I went to get a haircut I said, don't you think you could have done that before, church? He said, I didn't need one. I promise not to be so long this morning that you might need a haircut halfway through. Because actually what I want to show us is it's quite simple. I think it's all right here plainly in our text. There are six reactions that the people heard when they, they reacted in this way when they heard the Word of God. There were six of them, I think. The, the reading and teaching from the Bible in front of the gathered church caused these six reactions. If you go back to verse 1, you'll see the first one. It produced unity. The preaching and teaching of God's Word produced unity in God's people. All the people, it says, gathered as one man, one person. And it wasn't just because they were all in the same place at the same time. 
they came together on purpose to come under the reading and teaching of God's Word. It was their shared desire that made this unity. It says they collectively told Ezra to bring out the Bible and read it. They weren't looking for anecdotal little stories, illustrations. They just wanted the Bible spoken. Their community was rooted in their like-mindedness in God. God, may your word produce unity in us. Would you say that with me? God, may your word produce unity in us. One more time. God, may your word produce unity in us. But that's not all it produced. The second thing it produced was awe. Right? As they're standing there and they're hearing the word of God and it says, and all the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. That word attentive actually would use the illustration we would use and they hung on every word. They were so, they wanted to hear it that they hung on every word. It produced that kind of atmosphere among them, an atmosphere of awe. And the thing is, it wasn't this awesome speaker, this polished speech. You know, Ezra wasn't known for his speaking ability. He was just reading the Bible and they were so engaged. In fact, it says even before the book was read, we see a glimpse of their awe because it says they built a platform so that he could stand on it, so that the highest thing in the whole area, they wanted the Word of God to be elevated above everything else. And that psalm that Beth read, Pastor Beth read earlier, Psalm 138, verse 2, actually says, God, you have exalted above all things your name and your Word. And that's what we see playing out here. It wasn't this polished speech. They built this platform. And then it says in verse 5, if you're looking there, it says, when he opened it, what was their reaction? It was spontaneous. They felt, they all stood in awe. Wow. God, may your word produce awe in us. Say it with me. God, may your word produce awe in us. I'm not hearing this. God, may your word produce awe in us. And the third thing we see it produced was worship. It's even, now we've moved from this internal compelling thing to this external, they can't help but express it. Verse 6, And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered him, Amen! Amen! They're like shouting now. And they're raising their hands. This is getting a little bit rowdy here, guys. They're raising their hands in worship. Oh, no! And it says, They also bowed their heads and their faces. When Ezra the priest opens the Bible, and starts to read, all the people gather, just exclaim, Amen, Amen, and they're raising their hands. God, may your word produce worship in us. By now you should start to get this pattern. Say it with me. God, may your word produce worship in us. And it also produced humility. It produced humility. Verse 6 gives us that picture again. It says they bowed their heads with their faces to the ground. What, what a tremendous display of humility. It's as if through the, the reading of God's word, God was so manifestly present and they became so acutely aware of how small they were. Not unimportant but small in the presence of a glorious God. They did, in fact, realize that they fell short of the glory of God, just as Romans tells us that we do. God, may your word... That's good. Sorry. I have ADD to the hill. May your word produce humility in us. Say it with me. God... May your word produce humility in us. And so verse 9, look with me, verse 9 goes to the fifth reaction to the public reading and teaching of God's word. It says, it produced conviction. They wept and mourned as they listened. So you see, sometimes when we read the Bible, uh, we, we want to worship. We're, we're compelled to say, God, you are amazing. When you see like that Psalm 138, Wow, God, you are incredible, and it causes us to worship. Other times, 
were greatly convicted and want to weep. Sometimes parts of God's word exposes things in us, which is part of the reason we read it, right? Some of those things in us that are less than glorifying to God, that bring that conviction to us. And that's good. That's one of the, the things that God has purposed it to do. God, may your word produce conviction in us. Ready? God, may your word produce conviction in us. Now we're starting to get the handle on it. I'm starting to hear you. And the last thing, let it produce rejoicing. Verse 9 and 10, Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and the scribe, said this, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Don't mourn or weep. Go celebrate. Go rejoice. You see, it's not that weeping is inappropriate. It's very appropriate. And it's not like it was planned. Like here, we have you know pretty regimented things set out. It wasn't like they had a, a bulletin and now we turn to the section where we all weep and mourn. Could you imagine if that was part of a, pro, a programmed thing? But it wasn't. It just happened spontaneously. Just as they stood spontaneously, they also mourned spontaneously. But he tells them to stop. Stop mourning. Stop mourning and rejoice because everything you are mourning and weeping for is about to be taken care of. It's about to be covered. You see, they were mourning and weeping over their guilt, over their conviction. Having heard the word of God read, they knew that they fell short of the glory of God, but, and they knew they were guilty against God. But Ezra tells them to rejoice because all this is about to be removed from them. Their guilt and sin will be covered and removed by the sacrifice of an atoning lamb. Where do I get that from? Why do I think that that's what's going on here? Go back to verse 2. Remember I said this is an important notice, that it was the first day of the seventh month. The seventh month is an important month. The seventh month is the month where the Day of Atonement is celebrated. And if you don't know what the Day of Atonement is, you need to. It's the day, that day where the annual sacrifice of the Lamb, so that their sins would be atoned for and their guilt removed. You see, if there's no... no hope of atonement the conviction of sin without the promise of forgiveness without the hope of wholeness it'd be devastating it'd lead them to despair and that's where they were but this is why we can rejoice like them with them there is forgiveness there is covering this is why they told the people to go and celebrate it says verse 10 for the joy of the lord is your strength some translations might say the joy of the Lord is your stronghold what it really meant what they were hearing in their ears Ezra is saying to them listen the Lord God is your place of safety or refuge so it literally meant to them when you seek God as your refuge it's his joy and great pleasure to shelter you from your own sin did you hear that because God delights to save Jesus himself tells us this much. He says in Luke's gospel, I have come to seek and to save the lost because it's the Lord's good pleasure to do so. There's another obscure little Old Testament book, a prophet book called Zephaniah. Zephaniah prophesied during the same time as Nehemiah. And he says this in chapter 3, verse 17. The Lord your God is with you. He's the mighty warrior. He saves and he takes great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but you will, he will rejoice over you with singing. All of this happened when they're doing the public reading and teaching of God's word. It's exactly what God said would happen. This kind of, this would be produced under God's word. John, the gospel says in chapter 20, verse 30, Jesus did many more signs in their presence of the disciples but they're not all written in the book these are written so that you may believe that jesus is the christ the son of god and by believing you may have eternal life in his name amen that's what god has given us his word for in the back of your bulletins if you take your bulletins and open them all the way up the last two pages 
I have written in there just an edited list of some of the things that the Bible says about itself, really. You see, there's no mistaking that God has given us the Bible that we may know Jesus. But we would all agree that knowing something and believing it are two completely different things. Just knowing that God exists, that there was a Jesus, simply knowing a bunch of facts about God or Jesus or the Bible is not the same as actually believing what the Bible says. I'm not even going to try and compete with that. Believing what the Bible says, though, about God is critically important for your eternal well-being. Because the Bible says about God that He is good but holy and just. And we need to believe that He has wonderfully made Himself known to us through Jesus Christ. That the Bible tells us that. We need to believe it. But the Bible also says something about all of humanity. It says that all of humanity is actually alienated from Him because of sin. It actually says in the Bible that our first ancestors, Adam and Eve, were kicked out of the garden because they rebelled against God. And the Bible teaches us that it wasn't just Adam and Eve that rebelled. It was all of us. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. We all fall short of the glory of God. But I'm a good person, we say. How good? How, how good is good enough? And, and who are you comparing ourselves to? Who are we comparing ourselves to? The Bible reminds us that we're completely powerless to do anything about our condition. Well, now I see it, you can. That's so cool. But so is this. The Bible reminds us that we're completely powerless. To do anything about our condition. That all our goodness, listen to this. Because we ask the question, I'm a good person. The Bible says all our goodness will always fall short. But that's where the Bible helps us with the good news. That God, out of His love, mercy, grace, and compassion, sent Jesus to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. He's the covering of our sin. He's the forgiveness. He's the one who cancels the debt we could never repay. And the Bible does go on to say one more cool thing. Way more cool than that. That only by believing this and repenting of our sin can God have salvation or can we have salvation and enjoy Him eternally. It says there is salvation in no other name. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life and nobody comes to the Father except through me. The Bible tells us in Acts that there is salvation in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given among people by which we must be saved. Do we believe the Bible? Do we believe that the Bible offers us the free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ? If you don't, may I offer that to you right now. Invite Jesus. Believe. If you do already, I imagine that you are much like the people that we're reading about. That they are unity because of the Word of God. That you are in awe, not just of that. But you are humbling. Humbly compelled to worship. And then when you hear the scriptures read, or you read them yourselves, you rejoice in God. May his name be praised. We bow with me as we worship. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, even for this awesome display of power. What an incredible illustration of your power. It's so much greater than a little airplane. 
is you have a power to save. You have a power to bring salvation through Jesus. We rejoice in that, God. We celebrate that together as one body this morning, your church gathered. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to all of you. Um, I feel like the Holy Spirit was giving Pastor Mike a big exclamation point <laughs> with, the, with the show of sound that was coming through. <laughs> so in the Lutheran tradition, we um, end each prayer plea with the words, Lord, in your mercy, and you may respond, hear our prayer. So I will end each part, Lord, in your mercy, and you can respond, hear our prayer. Good and gracious God, we come before you as one in the Holy Spirit and join our voices in giving you thanks with our whole hearts. As you enfold us in your steadfast love and faithfulness, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need of good news. exalted your name and your word above all things. Gather your people into the body of Christ where your church is wounded, heal it. Where it is right, strengthen it. And where it is divided, reunited. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Maker of all that is, you created the universe and everything in it. Revive balance to the earth's fragile habitats. Cleanse oceans, lakes, and rivers, especially Lake Ontario, the Finger Lakes, and the Genesee River. Where there is drought, bring nourishing rain. Where there is devastation from fire or flood, bring relief. Sustain the well-being of every living thing and guide us to be good stewards of your creation. Lord, in your mercy. You rule over all the leaders of the earth. Guide all those who govern to rule with fairness. Address the needs of the most vulnerable. Work toward peace, especially in countries suffering from the devastation of war, like Ukraine, Russia, Gaza, and Israel. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, you answer us when we cry out to you. Even in times of great division, we know that those who follow you do not desire for anyone to come to harm. We pray for the safety and well-being of Donald Trump. Heal the two men who were critically injured and be with the families of those who mourn the death of the man who was killed and the attacker. Oh. that we may discuss differences and not resort to violence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious healer, bring healing and wholeness to those who are sick and grant peace and comfort to those who are dying. Bless the staff and volunteers of Teresa House as they offer love, dignity, and support to all they care for. Lord, in your mercy. 
At this time, I invite others to share their prayer concerns aloud or in silence. Faithful Lord, your steadfast love endures forever. Into your outstretched arms we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your steadfast love and mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. At this time we will be collect we, we will be collecting an offering. And if you brought an envelope from your church, it will be directed to that church. Any loose offerings we will, will be directed to Teresa House in Geneseo. They offer comfort care in a home-like setting for people nearing the end of terminal illness and their families. Offering baskets are still going around, but as they um, are finished, they can come up by the altar. And let us pray. Merciful God, as grains of wheat scattered upon the hills were gathered together to become one bread, so let your church be gathered together from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. Use us and the gifts we have gathered to sustain the world with your love. Bless Teresa House and their ministry as they care for those who are dying and their families. We ask this through the one who gave himself in love for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. We invite you to stand and join us as we sing a closing song together.
you remain standing, in your bulletins is the Lord's Prayer. Uh, some of us have different endings, so we're going to read it all together from here. If you'll join me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's bow together. Father, we do bow before you, the maker of heaven and earth. You are the King of kings and Lord of lords. You are the one who loves us with an everlasting love. We've heard that from your word from beginning to end today. That your love for us is full and complete in Jesus Christ. And that all who look to you have forgiveness and salvation. May your name be glorified, not just here this morning, in this place, but in all times, in this whole community, in all the world. And all of God's people said, Amen. God bless you and have a blessed rest of your day.